Okay, so now let's talk about ionic compounds. We talked about ions. Now we're going to talk about what happens when these compounds, uh, when these ions come together to form a compound. So the classic example for an ionic compound is sodium chloride. And the way this works is these tend to happen by the transfer. So ionic compounds tend to be formed by the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. So for example, with sodium chloride, we have Na and we have Cl. And when these react, what happens is the Na gives up an electron to the Cl. And so then we get Na plus and we get Cl minus. And these come together to form the compound, the ionic compound, NaCl. And so when these things come together, so there's no bonding necessarily between these two. There's no sharing of electrons. In an ionic compound, the electron has been fully transferred. So what's holding this together is the electrostatic interactions, meaning the, there's a plus charge and a minus charge, and that's what holds everything together. So we can say that the interaction is an electrostatic interaction between a positive and a negative charge. Okay, so then the other thing to know is that the ions are arranged in a lattice. And so what this is, what a lattice is, is it's a, uh, it's a collection of atoms that are um, organized in three-dimensional space, and it's periodic. So you can kind of think of this as Lego blocks. The Lego blocks come together, and they're in a repeating pattern in three-dimensional space. Um, so you have something that looks like this, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, and it just repeats and repeats and repeats, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And so that would be uh, an example of a lattice. It just keeps repeating on forever and ever and ever. So now let's take a look at how these things are um, grouped together. So we're going to look at a lecture problem. This one is lecture problem two, uh, and this is how we write the formulas of ionic compounds. So the formula of an ionic compound is written as the smallest integer number of different ions. So for example, Na and Cl. There's one Na and there's one Cl. So we write NaCl. Um, in silver oxide, for example, there's two silver for every oxygen. So we write Ag2O. Formula of an ionic compound, the net charge must be zero. This is really important. Um, that means that the positive and the negative charges must cancel out, right? We can't have a net charge overall. What you're going to notice is that when we write these things, polyatomic ions get put into parentheses. So like with iron nitrate, uh, we can kind of break this down. So in this case, you guys are going to memorize that nitrate is NO3 minus. So in this case, if we want to figure out what the charge is for the iron, if we have three NO3 minuses, that means that we have to have a plus three charge over here um, to, for everything to balance out. So you see that the Fe3 plus balances out with the three NO3 minus, and then that's how we get charge balance. Now, the reason why we put the NO3 into parentheses is because that comes as a group. That NO3, are the nitrogen and the oxygens are bound together in one molecule that has a charge. So we have to group that molecule together because that comes as a, a packet or a unit. So let me show you guys the trick. For, for doing this. So the, the really important thing is you got to memorize the polyatomic ions and you have to know the charges for the, um, the species from that table 2.4. Once you know that, then you have all the information you need to get everything else that you need. So the, the next most important thing is to understand how we can put these things together. So there's what we call the crisscross rule. So with something like lithium plus and Br minus, for example, so lithium comes in group one, so we know that has a plus one charge, and bromide is all the way over on the right, and that's in the, the group with the iron, the chlorine, and the, bromide, the bromine, so that's going to get a minus one charge. We know that from our rules 
So now how do we figure out what the ratio is going to be? Well, this one's a simple one. So we have one positive and one negative. So that's going to balance out if we just make it lithium bromide. But what you can actually do is you can actually crisscross these things. So you can bring the, the number here. So this is essentially plus one and this is minus one. And if you bring those down and you put lithium one, bromine one, you're going to get the right answer. So let's look at this with Mg uh, magnesium two plus and chloride. So by logic here, if we have magnesium two plus and we have to balance out that charge, we're going to need two chlorides to get that to balance. So we're going to write MgCl2, but our method still works. If we bring this two down and we bring the one down, then we see that we get Mg1Cl2. Okay, so let's do iron three plus and carbonate, which is a two minus. You can do it the harder way, which is to figure out how many of each one you would need to get a common charge. And the harder way would be, well, you have to look at this and say, well, I can't get three and two to add up evenly like we did with two plus and one minus. So you have to find what's, what's called a common multiple. And the smallest common multiple in this case would be six. So that would mean that I would need to get to six positives. I would need two iron three plus and I would need three CO three two minus. But we don't even have to get that complicated. We can just take the two and move that down to the iron, take the three and move that down to the carbonate. So we get iron two, CO three, three, and we're good. And we just do that by bringing the charges down. Now remember the parentheses are important. Carbonate is a polyatomic ion, so that's got to go in those parentheses. So when you're writing it out, that's really, really important. Given the information above, what is the charge on the copper ion in the following? Copper 2 carbonate. So let's just get ourselves some room to work. So we have copper 2. How do we work this out? Now remember, I said that the transition metals, you can't memorize the transition metals. The transition metals... Uh, these tend to have variable charge and um, it depends on the conditions, right? So, it, so examples of this is you could have copper one or you could have copper plus two. And you don't necessarily know which one you have unless you look at what it's connected with and how many of the other thing there are. So this is where it becomes really important that you know your other ions and your polyatomic ions because you can use the other ions to deduce what the charge is. So we don't know if this is copper 1 or copper 2. So let's look and see if we can figure this out. So we have copper 2 carbonate. And we know we can kind of pull this apart. We know that carbonate has a 2 minus charge. So working that back, if that's the case, if this has a two minus charge, then the copper in this case, since we have two of them, must have been plus one. Because it, it would take two of the plus one coppers uh, to add up to the carbonate uh, being minus two. So that's really where that's really why it's important. You have to you have to know those polyatomic ions in order to be able to work backwards. There is a technique that you can use in addition to what I just explained. So besides looking at this and saying, well, copper co uh, carbonate is a two minus charge and copper must therefore be a plus one charge because it's copper two carbonate. Um, there's another way of doing this. Another way of approaching this is to set up an equation where you basically say that the charge of the copper plus the charge of the carbonate has to equal zero. So you know that you have a minus two charge on the right, and this the whole thing has got to equal zero. So if you want to know what the charge for x is, uh, you basically have two x's, um, the, you have the two coppers, and then uh, you want to figure out, well, what is the charge of x? Is it a minus one or a minus two? So you start to kind of work this out. So you add two to both sides, and this is going to give you two. And so you have two x is equal to two, so you divide by two, and uh, it's going to give you x is equal to plus 1. And this should work for anything. This should allow you to figure out anything. You can actually check if you got the right answer um, on, a, on one of the previous ones. Like, for example, um, let's do a check iron 3 carbonate 1, I think it was.
So we had written Fe, uh, Fe2CO3 3. A way that you can check to make sure that it's right is to say, well, okay, I have 2 times the 3 plus charge of the Fe, and then I add to that 3 times the 2 minus charge of the CO3, because remember we said this is 2 minus and this is plus 3. This should add up to 0. So here I get plus 6. Over here I get minus 6. So plus 6 plus minus 6 gives us 0, and that checks. So that's just one other way to think about this, guys. Um, you have the kind of the just looking at it and making sure that you can tell that the charges balance out. Or if you need to be a little bit more pedantic and set up an equation to make sure you can figure it out, you can also do the equation method and that will work. This takes a little bit of practice um, working in the reverse direction, figuring out what you have. But remember, when it comes to the transition metals, we're always going to tell you something that's going to allow you to figure out what that is. The other ones you'll be able to memorize, but the transition metals you'll be able to deduce, to deduce from the conditions, meaning what it's bound to um, or what other compounds are in the ionic compound.